Greetings and welcome back to the Kiss My Aesthetic Podcast. My name is Michelle, of course, of MKW Creative Co. And I have Kiri on for the second time because we had technical difficulties the first time. So we're just going to call it like we see it. Kiri, welcome back to the podcast. I am happy to be here. And what happened to that recording? Is it just like deleted and lost forever? Oh my gosh. It was a garbage fire disaster and it was my fault. So I'm so grateful that you're here back again, giving me a chance to re-record because it was all kinds of issues on top (laughs) of like starting to get sick, which I feel like everyone knows what that brain fog feels like. But we're happy to be back again because we have a lot of good information to share with everyone. But without further ado, Kiri, can you tell us who you are, what you do, and who you help? Yes. Yes, I'd love to. Hi, I am Kiri Mohan, and I am a coach for freelancers. And I help those that have been freelancing already for a little bit who usually have a corporate background. So that's very important to me, how we use their corporate skills to showcase their business, make them more appealing for higher income clients and all of that. So I help those freelancers who are, their business is good, but I always say it's surviving and not thriving. So we want to get make them, you know, get them six figures. We want to make sure the right clients are coming into them. We want to make sure they're not charging hourly. We work on all that kind of stuff. I also host Her Balanced Hustle. It's a podcast where I interview women entrepreneurs. Generally, they have to make over six figures. I am pretty strict about that. And they have a team. And it's all about scaling your business while also maintaining a personal life. So how do you get that work-life balance? Is it even possible? Is that even the words we should be using? Because some people refuse to use it. And how do you scale a business? How do you get that advice from my guests so that you don't make mistakes that they might make? Mm-hmm. Useful stuff for sure. We cover obviously a lot of the similar topics here on Kiss My Aesthetic. But what I'm really excited to talk to you about today and what we had started talking about on the last podcast is getting your thoughts out there, right? And I think a lot of freelancers and what I've been talking about a lot recently is about how you have to be able to communicate what you can do to help people in a way that mm-hmm. actually helps them. And you had such an interesting note about how you actually get a good amount of your clients from Reddit. Can you tell us yes. what that whole experience is? Because the Reddit is a platform that I think I've been on maybe two times in my whole life. Um, so I'm very curious about the Reddit stuff. Wait, on the platform two times ever? Like not never, even because like never. when you Google search, you know, a question, now they actually pull in forums, which is so useful. But Reddit sure. was one of the top places I was always being directed to just because, I don't know, when you have kids that, you know, are struggling with some kind of weird health issue or you're breastfeeding or there's something going on, you're like, what is happening to me? I would Google the question and then just put in Reddit Uh and see where everyone else had the same issue. So anyway, what I started doing is being like, well, there must be like a freelancer section of Reddit and a business section of Reddit, right? And I started diving into them and I was like, oh, I can answer that question. I can help there. I can do that. And I started doing that. And what ended up really making me realize that I could have and get clients from Reddit was, um, I want to say a few, was it two years ago? Someone was like, I want to be a virtual assistant. And that's how I actually started my freelancing was as a VA. Okay. And then it grew. Actually, I started freelancing on a bunch of different things. But I doubled down on VA, I think, within the first six months because it was so easy to get work as a VA. But anyway, this person was like, I want to be a VA. I, I got my first client. I got $300. I'm really excited. And I said, hey, congrats. I know what that first client is like. $300. Awesome. I ended up making 150 k plus a year as a VA. And all of a sudden, just swarms of DMs and comments how because VA is one of the most underpaid of course freelancing professions out there and I said wow oh I can use this to get clients so then I was like hey I'm gonna set up a call and we're gonna set up a call on, on this day and if you can join that's great I'll talk about how I did it and how I ended up specializing and moving away from being a VA and all these things and people just started coming to it and then I started messaging each person one by one when I started doing group coaching and then private coaching and then people just started gravitating towards that and then I started being more active on Reddit and that's that's basically was is the shortened version. But every time I have someone on Reddit who seems interested in what I'm saying and really engaging with me, I will DM them. And I love Reddit because you can just be so much more forthright. You don't have to like play the games of like, Mm -hmm. oh, I noticed you did this and I love what you're doing. Would you like a free audit or something like that? That's not Reddit. That's not the way it is. You can just say, hey, I'm a coach. This is what I do. I have a workshop coming up. If you're interested, you might be a good candidate. Here, you can sign up, right? And I have people going to my profile 
when I give advice and they, I just had someone contact me last week. It was like, hey, I'm, I want to leave corporate and build an agency with my skills. Can you help me? Let's jump on a call. Mm-hmm. It's just so much more forward, like straightforward, and there's no frills. And that means you can get some nasty people. Of course. In the, in the subreddits who are just like annoying and mean. But it's also just like so much more straightforward. And I like that. I'm a very straightforward person. So for me, Reddit's been a good goldmine of clients. Yeah. I mean, it sounds like it. But tell us a little bit your path because you said VA and then you became specialist and now you're a coach. What was your corporate background? Because you have experience kind of leaving that corporate structure and getting into, okay, now all of a sudden I'm my own boss. Where are these clients going to come from? What was that transition? How many years ago was that? And, And what what was kind of your tipping point of like, okay, I don't think I can do this work for somebody mm. else, like nine to five stuff anymore? Yeah. So that was nine years ago. 2015 is when I officially gave my notice, but I started freelancing probably 2011, 2012. So I just entered the workforce and I just was doing things here and there on this platform called Odesk, which is now Upwork. It was bought by Upwork. Oh. And I just started doing little projects here and there. And um, my corporate background was as an executive assistant and my strengths were marketing. I helped a lot of the marketing teams as well as C-levels. So I had event planning. I had marketing experience. I had the normal EA experience. Um, and I was getting bored in my job because a lot of the people that I supported and the teams I supported traveled a lot. They were going to like the conferences. I would only go to conferences like once a year, but they would go consistently and they were doing sales stuff and they were never there. So I started being like, I could just work from home. This is dumb. So I looked up online, how do you work from home? And I stumbled upon freelancing and using your skills to freelance. And I was like, oh, this is intriguing. And then I started looking into it more and I started being like, oh, no, I have to, you know, find my own clients and I have to set my own rates and I don't know how to do that. And that's scary. No. So I got a new job. That was my solution. Like, oh, well, I'm bored here. I'll just get a new job. And then it really was the same thing, just different people in the new job. And of course, my skills were growing a little bit. I had a little bit more responsibility. But about four months into that new job, I said, you know what, let's just try this freelance thing. So I I did quite a few things in the beginning. I tried like copywriting. I tried social media management. That was not my thing. I even tried like creating (laughs) the images, doing newsletters, doing Facebook, like all this stuff. And I settled on being a VA, but specifically working with, again, like conferences, planning events. And then gradually I started being like, you know what, I think I can make more money if I work with like founders directly. So why don't I shift and be that executive assistant freelance? And there was like none of us out there at that point. And Mm -hmm. it was kind of a tough battle to convince people like, no, really, I can save you money, really. And I... And I ended up um, marketing that service quite heavily and doing a lot of cold reach outs pre-Reddit. And I ended up within nine months of when I started marketing, I was at that tipping point where I was like, oh my God, do I continue working here or not? And then I, around that time, I started having pregnancy issues. And so I needed to go to the hospital a lot and I had to make up excuses. And I started feeling trapped. I started feeling like these people don't support me. I'm going through miscarriages and like just oh, two failed pregnancies in a corporate office, having to go back to work after you have like a DNC, if anyone knows what that is. It's just so hard. And that kind of just coincided with like the marketing picking up. And so I had to make a decision. And I think it was like personal and the fact that I didn't want to be around these people anymore. And I didn't want to feel like because at that point it was like I might just continue to have pregnancy issues. This might just be my life. So let's try the freelancing. And at that point, the the clients were also starting to demand more. I was getting more referrals. And I was at that tipping point where I was like, I need to make a decision because the calls were, I would be watching my phone at my desk in my cube, seeing the phone light up with client stuff. And I was like, (gasps) can't even answer it, right? Mm -hmm. So Mm -hmm. that's a long story. I didn't mean to make it that long, but that is how I went from corporate to being an online contractor. And do we agree we love it? We love working for ourselves? I do. Okay, good. I do. Um, It's gotten a lot more difficult, I think, having two kids, but I still wouldn't trade it for the world. I would not trade it. As difficult as the days can be, and if I have to get up really early or work really late because the kids are sick, it's still like, oh, thank God I don't have to worry about like taking time off again. Like when you're going Mm -hmm. through a cycle of sickness in the house and you're sick and your kids are sick and asking for more time off again and having, you know, it's just, thank God. Even in the hardest moments, I'm like, I'd rather have 
this than have to report to someone and go into an office and even working from home, but having to report to someone, not my jam, not my jam. What's so interesting is we had different paths, but ended up in the same spot because I had a different kind of enter of the workforce, so to speak, where I started my business in college. So as a 20 year old and then graduated and my parents are very entrepreneurial. My whole family is very entrepreneurial. And they're like, yeah, hey, kid, you should start charging money for that. And I was like, what? How do I do that? I was like, what's an invoice? I don't understand. And this was 20. 14. So they kind of helped me with those first few referrals, first few clients, first few kind of just like getting the basics down. Um, but then I've only done that ever since. So I've never been in a corporate environment ever. I've never worked a nine to five job ever. I worked at like the call center at my university and I was an intern at an art museum and a nanny. And that's my prior, that's my CV. So <laughs> it's just funny that how the way life works and how things shake out. And then I think also what a different world we live in now than 2014. Oh yeah. Oh my oh, yeah. goodness. I remember digital nomad traveling in 2016. 16, 17, 18. And by then they were projecting that 33% of the American workforce was going to work remote. So only 33%. And then obviously the pandemic happened and then it was 100% of people pretty much are working remote. Um, But I think it's shifted the way we think of jobs and the way that we align ourselves with the companies that we work for or don't. Um, I think, you know, my parents' generation, although they were entrepreneurial, their peers were like lifers at companies. Like you worked at the same insurance company for 40 years and then you had your retirement party and you didn't jump jobs. You didn't switch. But now the stats for millennial and Gen Z are staggering. I just gave a presentation. So I have the stats like fresh, fresh on my laptop. But between millennials and Gen Z, which I think are two populations that are really interesting to look at right now, 44% of millennials freelance and 67% of Gen Zers either currently freelance or plan to freelance at some point. What do we think of those stats? Is that surprising to you? Or does that feel totally on par with the audience that you get to talk to on a regular basis? I would say most of my audience is actually millennials and they come to me lately. I've been seeing they come to me because they've been laid off or they've been burned out. Yeah. Um, so I think there is a shift starting to happen, especially since the pandemic, because the pandemic woke so many people up to say, wait, I don't need to be employed or I can do this on my own or I don't want to be reporting to someone because in the beginning of the pandemic or at least a lockdown, I think people had a, like this freedom to be with their kids, to go outside and work on their patio or their garden or something in between meetings. And they're like, I actually really like this. And I I don't want to be beholden to someone anymore. So I think the millennial one is really accurate. The Gen Z, I actually have not worked with many Gen Zers, but I have had Gen Zers reach out to me to try to get my business, to try Mm -hmm. to work with me as a client. And what I've noticed is like they want to I, this is a generalization. These are the people who've reached sure. out to me, but their pitching yes. and their their demeanor is not appealing. It's Agreed. not. It, it needs Agreed. practice. <laughs> we'll say that Agreed. they need to practice because the people that they've the universities they've gone to or colleges or community colleges have not taught them how to be an enviable hire. There's a huge skill gap of like being someone that somebody would hire, right? On in a freelance capacity. And I had this whole instance happen to me. I got a DM from someone saying like basically a cold pitch saying, do you have someone for your email marketing? And I said, yep. And they go, okay, sure. And I basically <laughs> went back and forth with a banter with this guy for probably 45 minutes to an hour and say, And I said, okay, sure. And I said, question for you. I was like, before you pitched me, did you subscribe to my email newsletter? And he said, no. I said, so how could you possibly help me if you didn't even look at the work product that you were insisting that you could get me results on? And he's like, well, uh, that's a good point. I said, did you go to my website? He says, no. I was like, did you see that I have someone on my team that does email marketing? And he's like, no, I didn't look. And I said, so if you were me, would you hire yourself? And he was basically like, no. And I was like, here's the deal. When you're going to pitch someone, number one, do your research. First oh, and foremost. Yes. Number two, solve a problem. Say, hey, Michelle, I noticed that you send email newsletters, but I've been on your list for the last six months and you've only sent out once a month. I really think you could double your audience by sending out two newsletters a month. You know what I mean? I said, go solve a problem and I'd be way more interested in listening to you. But you coming to me saying, 
pay me money to do a thing you already have covered is of zero interest to me as an employer. Like none. Absolutely. I go into this with my- Are you getting similar style pitches? Because I end up just deleting them from my email. Every once in a while, I get a wild hair at my ass and I'm like, all right, let's play. You want to play? Like, let's play checkers here. And I end up kind of like schooling them on it. And then I hilariously got a testimonial out of this guy. I said, here's what I want you to do. I want you to co-write me a testimonial. (laughs) (laughs) And I said, I want you to use my strategy in your next 10 pitches and then come back to me if it worked or not. And so we kind of had this like funny rapport. But I'm curious if that's similar style pitching that you've been receiving. Yeah, two thoughts on that. So I I do go into this with my students and my my clients, basically. And my coaching, my course actually has examples and a formula in it, like how to do a pitch that will get a response, right? And how do you offer value? And I actually use an example of someone who went and was like, hey, I signed up for your newsletter list and I noticed that your automation is like lacking. It was something like very specific that I was like, oh my God, you went to that trouble? Like, okay, let's talk. Because fair enough, like you've gotten my attention because you even put that much effort. Second thought, I actually just had a call yesterday with a Gen Zer who, you know, messaged me and said, hey, did you know that courses can bring you up to $90,000 in three months or something like that? And I was like, I have a course. And he goes, how's that going for you? And I was like, well, it's not really something I sell actively because it's more like something I use within my group coaching and stuff like that, but you can buy it on your own. He's like, so your sales aren't going well. And I was like, that's not really what I'm saying. But, you know, I'd be happy to talk with you if you really think this is, it was again, like the kind of playing I could tell he hadn't really looked into it. So I get on a call with him yesterday and he's going through all this stuff about making a course. I said, I already, I already made a course. I told you that the course is done. He's like, oh, okay. So you just need help marketing it. I was like, well, not really, because that's not the point of the course, but sure, let's play. Let's say we're, I need help marketing. He brings up this bad Excel sheet. Like if you sold your course at a thousand dollars, 10 of them a month, you would get $10,000 going through this whole thing that I'm like, well, obviously. So then I said, and how much do you charge for this? He said, $5,000 a month plus 35% of your course sales. And I said, what are your case studies? How many clients have you, have you worked with so far? Do you have any one you could refer me to? I don't have any clients. Okay. So then you don't, you can't charge $5,000. I said, I, yeah, I said, I've paid $5,000. That's not an issue. The issue to me is that you have no clients. You never worked on this and you want to be a guinea pig. If you want to come back and work on commission-based only and practice, I'd be open to it. He said, no, no, no. The value of what I can offer, I've been working with this mentor and I know that I can give you 5,000, for $5,000, I can give you 10 sales. And I was like, no, it was it was so painful, but yet laughable. And that that is like a similar experience, not completely that that was a, an extreme, but like I'm having similar experiences with Gen Zers who reach out to me where their pitch is not quite good, but I'm like, ha ha, okay, let's try this. And then like you try to give advice and it, it's more like closed minded, like, no, but I know what I'm doing. I'm like, you might know what you're doing, but you're not convincing me that I want to sign up with you and that you know what you're doing. But you don't know what you're doing if you've never done it before. Oh, if yeah, that too. Know, that was an extreme. Do it, if you take archaeology 101, it does not mean you can go out on a site in ruins and uncover artifacts. That does not mean you're an archaeologist. So like there is there is this distance. And I think because of social media, the way it is and the internet the way it is, there is this kind of like instantaneous, anyone can be an expert, anyone can be educated in anything. And online education is like the wild, wild west, right? Like we don't have a governing body that tells us that your your co- online course that you took from so-and-so from Instagram actually taught you anything. And to be honest, yeah. majority of these courses are full of a whole bunch of fluff. So it's, it's very different than seeing on someone's resume, I have a degree from Harvard Business School, right? Like that's gonna be, okay, maybe you're more qualified, But even then I had, I was talking to high schoolers recently who said, what college courses should I take to be a brand designer? I want to do what you do. What college courses should I take? And I said, I don't know that it's a factor of what courses you have to take as much as you need to learn by doing, which means that you have to price extremely either at market price or below, because when you don't have experience, you are a risk for someone to hire Mm. you. And I said, a good rule of thumb is do something low rate. After the first five clients, up your rates by 20% and just keep Uh, going based on demand, baby. Speaking my language. I say the same thing in my in my coaching, in my course. I say, if you really want to, like, you know, get experienced, price slow. If you want to use, this is my actually my advice for freelancer marketplaces, but it can apply even when you're not using a freelancer marketplace is saying like, do lower just to get testimonials because the testimonials yes. are 
gold. When you have those on your website, people are less likely to grill you. They're less likely to be like, I need to see all your references. They're less likely to do any of that. Like the guy I talked to yesterday didn't even have a website. I was looking around for him online. I'm like, where is this dude? Like he just randomly on LinkedIn popped up. Like (laughs) there's so much. And they think like, oh, but all I need is a social media account. The people who are getting business just from social media have spent years crafting what they do, looking at analytics, diving into that, seeing exactly how they can speak to that person, right? Their ideal client. It's not something you just like a few cold pitches and you're just going to magically get someone and you don't have a website or any kind of testimonials. Like, please, please, girl. Yeah. I mean, that was the great (laughs) irony of this guy that messaged me about the email marketing is you go to his page and he had like nine posts and it was all about like the graphics, the background of the graphics was like stacks of money. (laughs) It was like hustle mindset, grind every day. Like so bro marketing, so yucky. But I think it happens in circles of women too, right? It's like, it's so funny. I was watching Neil Brennan. If you follow, you know who he is. He's a comedian. He has like a stand up comedy show. And he goes, you know, guys will market themselves like alpha male lifestyle car, the money, the whatever. He's like, but women, women are on a journey. (laughs) He's like, Mm. and they're going to use the T word to sell you stuff. And he's like, you know what the T word is? Trauma. And I'm like, oh my God, that's so true. Because it's so funny that I think this is what you're kind of allergic reaction to maybe Instagram or other places is like everything feels shrouded in this like big storytelling whatever it's like no no I can solve your problem let me show you how I can solve your problem like that directness I think is really attractive to me Um, that's very much how I've run my business in this podcast but to your point about like website or not the testimonials when you start that is your network that is your referral Mm -hmm. network so if you are so good at your job I know people that don't have websites simply because they are too busy because they are so good that they can't refer it out Right. And they're booked. And they're like, eh, don't really need a website because I've got this huge track list of all these people that are so happy with what I was able to do. And like, that's also a route to go. But if you don't have that, then you definitely can't come out swinging, charging $5,000. And refusing to budge, by the way. Like, I oh offered him other goodness. options. I was like, if I'm going to be a guinea pig, you better lower your prices. You better have different options. And he didn't. He was like, nope, I know what I do is really good. <laughs> okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, it is kind of crazy. And I think the Gen Z audience, to your point, before is like they're so influenced they are the first generation that has always had smartphones always and social media and social media and so their understanding of that landscape is very different i think than any other generation and when i'm talking to younger people i'm always like this is a superpower like you guys you are plugged into brands the way that every other generation isn't plugged into brands like you understand shifts in culture and music and style and fashion and all these things so my biggest piece of advice to young people is like if you're considering wanting to freelance develop Develop your taste, like work on your taste because you can learn skills. But I think if you have great taste and you know how to communicate what you make and how you make it, that those things will serve you really far um, instead of only focusing on like, okay, I need to learn Illustrator, for example, or I have to learn Photoshop. Mm -hmm. It's like Canva exists. AI exists. Like all of these other tools, that landscape is going to change. So if you can focus more on what problems do I solve? Who do I want to work with the best? What are my values? And what is like my personal, you know, fingerprint that I'm putting on the world, that that could prove to be way more fruitful in these like transition years between jobs than trying to go around and like Pokemon collect every skill set that there is. What do you think about that? Maybe that's an unconventional opinion. No, I I think you make a good point that you skill sets, even when I was starting out pre like Canva and all this stuff, I remember just saying yes, and I was going to learn it. And actually, you know what? Canva just came out in like 2014 or 15. And I remember a client being like, I need someone who can use Canva. And I had no idea how to use that. And I went into there with a free account, created something. It had the Canva watermarks all over it. And I said, and I sent it in my proposal. I said, I've never used Canva, but this is my first time. And this is what I created. So I know I can do what you need me to do. And she ended up hiring me, even though it had watermarks. And even though I said it was my first time, she was like, I love that you showed that initiative because that means that anything I throw at you, you're going to figure it out. And I mean, I jumped in. There was like, I had a, a client who had products. I had never used the back end of these systems because products back ends are very different from like the other freelance service back ends I had to use. And like Shopify just came about. I had to learn Shopify when it came about. There was all these things. I was just like, I'm going to just jump in and learn it. I do teach actually in my coaching. So this might, I don't know if this reflects badly on what you teach. I don't know. But it's like, I, I teach people to actually really do a lot of research on their ideal industry 
that they want to go after yes. and ideal clients. And then what I teach them is I say, look at all their branding, look at their colors, yep. look at their logos, look at the way they write and incorporate that into your own. So like I had one person who had this, like she wanted to work with these very heavy health agencies as a writer, copywriter. They were all blues and white. All, almost every single ideal industry and client she pulled up with blue, blue and white. And her whole web page was purple and light mm -hmm. purple. And, and I said, if you're trying to attract these clients that are very specifically in this realm, you need to bring more blue and white into your, like, because we are used to gravitating where we gravitate to what we are used to and what we see reflected and what we want to understand. And so that's something I try to teach them is to look at your ideal clients, look at your ideal industry and mimic some of that in your own branding, on your own webpage, in your own images, because then they're going to be more likely to be like, that person gets me, that person knows me. Of course. No, it makes perfect sense. And this is completely aligned with what we were talking about and also aligned with what I've been telling um, these high school and college students, which is like, as you as a professional are growing, like you're developing your taste, you're developing your personal style, you're developing your brand in a way, right? Like you're showing up as a freelancer, you're being hired as the person that you are and the things that you know. But also, if you want to scale, people are buying into the brand. It's not when someone yes. works with MKW Creative Co. Now, it's not a guarantee they are working directly with me, but you are now working with the company, which there's a lot of me in it. Believe me, it's like my favorite colors and things that I find interesting and my backlog of inspiration inspiration from traveling and all these places. So there's a lot of me embedded in it. But building something outside of yourself as a different entity is a whole undertaking. But we were absolutely intentional with the color palettes that we use and the sound that we use on reels and the copywriting language and the way that our platforms are set up and the way that we take calls and even the podcast is an extension of that. So we're constantly having that conversation because we love to work with the person who's like the marketing manager of a portfolio. So a portfolio mm. of homes, a portfolio of mm. wines, a portfolio of businesses. They are the marketing person who is the liaison between the C-suite and us saying, I don't have this much marketing and design capacity in-house, but Michelle, I want to partner with your team so that we can create things together that are going to make me look amazing to my boss. And so I'm always having that language with them. It's like, you know, like, hey, we're here to make you look really good yes. until you're ready to bring that in-house, um, which is a really fun position to be in. It took us a long time to get there, but we're, I'm constantly having conversations with my mentors of like, how can I show up for that person? How can I show up for the person that's listening to my podcast because it makes them better at their job? How can I show up for the person that's saving our Instagram stories and sending them or emulating what we're doing because they think it's going to help their company. Um, and kind of finding that middle ground. But absolutely, if there's an industry you want to work in or there's things that you're that excite you, start to create a sliver for yourself of the internet where you can represent that. Yes. I think that's a really smart advice. Yes. I call, I call it my reflection framework. And it's just basically reflecting what you want. Your, until you get confident, you get enough clients, you can do whatever the F you want. <laughs> like then, but even then, it's like you always have to be conscious. Like I'm in the process of rebranding everything because I used to only work with women who were in a corporate job and want Wanted to leave, but I slowly started to shift where the need is greater for my services, which is these people who have been laid off, these people who have been burned out, and these people who are like, I want to take my corporate skills, but create a business with it, not just a task taker, right. not just be a freelance right. task taker. I want to grow it. I want to scale it. I want to have 10,000 plus months. How do I do that? And there's a lot more business strategy in that. And as I started to work with these people, my branding has started to change. It's not so, I don't want to say bold, but just like my sure. branding before was very corporate. It was very much like I'm trying to speak to that corporate mm -hmm. women and bring them. Now it's softer. The hues are softer because these people are already working from home. They're already, they might be moms. They're more feminine. And I've been trying to like scale it back. I still have the same well, color. Colors, but there's more neutrals. Them, you're meeting them at a more emotional place, probably. Yes. I would imagine like versus someone who's like, oh, this is just strictly career. This is strictly business. I'm leaving this. I'm doing this now. Someone mm. who's been laid off and wasn't expecting to be laid off or someone who's burnt out and didn't ever think that they were going to get to that point. It has to be a softer approach. You're meeting them at a place where they are more vulnerable. They are, I would imagine, more scared. They are a little bit like, I don't know. I'm, I'm doubting myself, whatever. So if you come at them with all caps, and bright yellow and bright red and bright blue, <laughs> like it's going to be an assault on the senses. Like we need to dial it back. Right. So 
it, that makes perfect sense to me. I think of my friends that are still in corporate right now, a lot of them are project managers at like big Fortune 500 companies. And they are at that point where they're like, ah, I really would just love to work for myself and not do this anymore. And I'm trying to explain to them, I was like, you don't realize how untapped being a good analytical project manager is like as an asset to a creative because creatives have always been freelancers because we all have ADHD and we're all ping pong brains and we're, you know, can't stick to a schedule to save our lives. But I'm telling you, like Cody, my business manager is a godsend because she takes all of this chaos and she can organize it in a way that still moves projects forward. And that skill set, I think, is such a corporate lending skill set that I think that my friends who are project managers are going to start to realize like, oh, wait a second, if I just find the yin to my yang of the creative person, I can like wrangle them and it'll be really fun. Are you noticing that as well? And there's a lot of like solopreneurs out there who have more than one business. And I see project managers really excel working with those kind of clients because they can have three different businesses that sometimes overlap. Like for instance, instance, I remember um, this guy who was a best-selling author, also a consultant, and also a speaker. Oh, gosh. It was like, it was a lot. And I remember the project manager going in and being able to like figure, because there's a lot of different invoices. There's a lot of different billings. There's a lot of different workshops. There's like paid workshops, paid speaking engagements, and all this stuff. And she just was like, I'm able to organize all of this. I'm able to do it properly. I'm able to look ahead. And once you she got to that point, it was just like, oh. and there's, and there's, I, I think people with that corporate background, I don't want to, in some ways they have an advantage. And this is why I like working with them because they have these skill sets that they've refined in these furnaces. Like basically yeah. they've been refined like gold and silver because they've worked with fast paced environments. They've worked with like people who could be really frustrating and really difficult to work with. They've learned people skills. They've learned how to manage all of that. And they've been refined to a freelancer. If they can bring that skill, they're going to yeah. find freelancing like a breeze, a breeze sometimes. And they're going to be like, because they have that skill set that's so good. And they're, and they're going to find clients who are like, oh my God, you're so good at what you do. Why is that? Because they did work in corporate. So going back to this whole Gen Z of people who just want to go straight to freelancing, there's an advantage to working in an office that Absolutely. you're not going to get anywhere else. And I know you never worked in an office, so that's why I feel like kind of bad saying oh, this. No, but like, no, 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 no. This is my own personal like Achilles heel imposter syndrome because I'm out here building and growing teams. I've never built a team before. I've never written, I've never seen a corporate handbook before. I hired mentors because I was like, am I doing this right? We have to offer healthcare now. How do I do that? I don't understand. Like all of this stuff is foreign to me because I've never been on the other side of it. So it's both a greatest strength because I feel like I don't have any preconceived ideas or I'm not comparing it to anything else. But on the other hand, I straight up don't know what I don't know. So it's a big slice of humble pie. Um, And I still, I still have days 10 years into this business I'm like, I should just shut it all down and just like go get a job somewhere. Like but everyone has that. I have that still. Like, and I've been doing this 10 years. I don't want to be responsible. <laughs> when a client project goes sideways, when a team member's not happy, you're like, I'm not feeling creative. I was like, it would be so nice to just go to an office, show up, do your four things you have to do that day and then go home and then not think about work. That's the thing is like, you don't have the luxury of, of turning off necessarily. I feel like now there's more conversations about boundaries. And obviously when you have kids and a family like that, is a very natural boundary for your work. Um, but one of the students yesterday in, in the high school group asked me like, what's it like being your own boss? Because I don't think I ever want to work for anyone else ever. And I said, I hate to break it to you. <laughs> I said, but when you work for yourself, it's not that you don't have a boss. It's that all your clients kind of become your boss. So almost nobody operates where they just create and they're not at the beck and call. Beholden to someone. Yeah. Right. Beholden to someone at the beck and call of the industry at like you still at the end of the day have to make an income somehow. So like even if you're an artist, right, and you make paintings, like you still have to talk to a gallery owner to show your work and submit. And like, there's a lot of administrative shit in that. And so your boss then becomes something external to you. The beauty is like you were saying before is having the ultimate flexibility to be able to work when it works with your schedule. So like that's But even thing. even then, like a lot of the things I work with on my clients is like somehow they've become this working machine that never stops and clients take advantage of them. And they're like, hey, I actually need this tomorrow. It's like, how do you set up those boundaries in your contracts so that you you're, you have something to stand upon when someone says, I need this in three hours or I need this tomorrow or can you get this done now? You can say, actually, you're you're not signed up for that on my contract. If you would like that, I'm happy to do it, but it will cost you an extra X. 
amount of mm-hmm. dollars. We love a rush fee. Or, or I'm sorry, I just cannot do it. It's just not possible today, right? Because you did not have in your contract or pay for these extra kind of turnaround times and stuff like that. So I find that like a lot of the freelancers I work with, they still are like just getting swallowed up by not having boundaries, just working all the time. All the time. And it's about teaching them that too. So it's like, it takes, it does take a while, I think, to get to the point that you have that freelancer lifestyle that you love so much. I think it took me about six years, seven years. And then I started coaching and teaching people how to do it. But I wasn't about to start coaching people until I had actually worked through that myself and figured out how to get that lifestyle that you see on Instagram. (laughs) Right. Of course. Well, and Tim Ferriss, four hour work week. Oh, Tim Ferriss. You love to hate him, right? Because it's like, yes, it's delicious in the way that like driving a Ferrari sounds delicious, right? Like, like, yes, I'd love to drive a Ferrari, like rip down the 101 in a Ferrari. But by the time you can't figure out where to park it, gas is crazy expensive, all the parts are expensive, you're constantly stressing out about this car. Like, at what point are there diminishing returns, right? So same with four hour work week, like, yes, you can build to there. But I think that it sold an idea of a bit of being an online entrepreneur that was is now already out, outdated and, and somewhat unrealistic. Like, I think that it's really easy to fall victim to some of that stuff, because it it sounds so attractive and it sounds so amazing. And I think a lot of this podcast is about kind of showing people that like, it can be both. It can be amazing. And I can go work from Lake Como for two weeks with my sister, but then I can also be working all day on Saturday, which is what I did two days ago to make sure that I got something done by a deadline that I promised. So for also all to- the podcast listeners right now, which is all of you go check out if books could kill. They do a Ooh. whole episode on Tim Ferriss's four hour work week and debunk and tear it apart. And it's basically, they were like, you know, this is not possible for the majority of people. This guy was a tech entrepreneur who was making 70,000 a month before he decided to try this lifestyle. And he has all these advantages that other people don't have. And then on top of that, the four hours, the rest of those hours, other people are slaving away for you. And you have to have the money to pay for them. So it's like, they're like, there's so much in that episode. And I I hope if anyone loves a four-hour work week that you have an open mind and just try to listen to that episode and listen to them debunk it because yeah. it's it's quite a book. It is. And it's one of the ones that like it's it's I think it's already kind of um, aged out. Do you yes. know what I mean? Like and even in such a short time frame, which is so wild. But I think well, a lot 10 of 10 years, haven't... right? Wasn't it? Yeah. 2014? Yeah, I think so. Something or like no, that. No, no. I think it was earlier than 2014. Sorry. No, I think it was earlier. Really? Yeah. I think it was 2010 or 2011. Yeah. So interesting. But I think we're having a lot of these same conversations with like AI too, right? Like how all these AI tools are evolving and they're now projecting that 90% of online content by 2025 is going to be created by AI. That's is... insane. Wow. But also, it makes sense. It does. It does help. But I always am editing it. Whatever they give me. AI is just like... Because we should. Because (laughs) we should. If you only ate every single meal out of a vending machine, you wouldn't be healthy, right? Mm -hmm. Like, we can't just take what the computer is pumping out here and, like, take it at face value. And this is, again, this goes back to, like, developing taste, staying creative. Mm -hmm. Um, One of the students asked me, like, where do you go for inspiration? Like, if I'm a designer and I want to find more more inspiration like what are your sources i said number one get off the internet (laughs) that's Mm. the first tip like get out of the wormhole of seeing number one what everybody else is doing and limiting yourself to only the things that exist in the internet like human history i've been around for millennia like go travel go eat different foods go sit on the beach like there's so many other places to kind of expand your horizons and i think that that's the beauty of like For me, that's the beauty of what AI is bringing to the table is it's allowing me to do my job faster so I can do more of that. Mm -hmm. So I can be more of a creative observer. I can educate myself on stuff that's not so accessible and so fast, um, but like kind of break off from that. Curious to ask you, where do you go to learn about your field? Oh, that is a good question. So I do have a Google alert on my email where every day it 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 sends me freelancer articles, freelancer data. So then I'm looking that and trying to understand. I would say to learn more about freelancers in general, I have used social media a lot. And I post almost daily on LinkedIn. That's my most active um, platform. And I look at the analytics and I say, what are people interested in? And then I go to my competitors, which uh, by the way, I have to say, I have to be in a very good mental health space to go to my competitors because I I get upset easily. And I'm like, oh, why didn't I think of that? Oh, I was going to post that tomorrow. Oh no, now I need to shift it. Like I get all worked up, right? But the 
But when I'm in a good mental health space, I'm like, okay, I'm going to use this for data, going to my competitors, seeing who they're engaging with, seeing what they're saying and who's responding the most gives me more and more data. So again, Reddit, I think any kind of Facebook group, Reddit, anything like that is very, very useful. The Google Alert has been very useful in terms of cold, hard data, like how many freelancers are there? What's Gen Z looking at for freelancing? What's millennials doing, et cetera? That's very helpful. And even like I got an article the other day about retirees and how they're freelancing a little bit. So that was useful to know. Mm -hmm. And then from there on LinkedIn, what posts of mine are doing the best? What are people interested in? A lot of it revolves around pricing. That's a big one. And then what are my competitors doing? What are they talking about? What are their posts get the most comments to? So I guess that's that's where I get all my information. Um, I wish I could say it was something very, very um, enlightening. <laughs> no, but then I think that's useful too, right? Like use the tools at our disposal. But as you said, like you have to be in the right mental headspace to do so. I'm sure you have time limits to some of these things because you the other trap you could fall into is absolute imposter syndrome and fall down this whole rabbit hole of like, well, I keep following everyone that's doing what I'm doing and now I'm too stunned to make a move, right? And I think even in, in the mentor group that I have, someone had explained this to me and I said, go follow your ideal client then. Stop following the people who are your competitors and go follow the people that you want to help. And it sounds like that's a lot of what you do on Reddit. Um, And even LinkedIn is like, okay, who are the people that actually need what I can do? Because then it's going to be, it's way more of a dopamine hit to help someone than to feel intimidated by watching something that you think you should be doing. Yes. It's, It's a fine balance. And I teach that with my coaching. It's like, I want you to look at your competitors. I do. Yeah. But I was thinking when you were talking all about, you know, someone saying like, how do I get creative or where do I find other places? Like social media can be one of the biggest stunters to creativity because totally. you fall into it, it traps you or it feels like you just steer in headlights. You're like, well, I don't know. I'm never going to be as good as these people. Maybe like the imposter syndrome. You're saying like, oh, but what could I post? I could possibly, oh, I don't, well, never mind. I'm not going to do anything. I'm just going to mm-hmm. save all these posts for when I get mm-hmm. around to it. Right. And so I think that, yeah, I don't even know where I was going with that. I think their message is just my- <laughs> start, start messy, right? Like start yeah. messy and then grow and refine and go back to your analytics and go back to what's resonating with people. Go back to those testimonials. Like one of the first things I did with ChatGPT was give it all of our old testimonials and say, what are the three most common things that clients love about us? And it wasn't the creativity. It was our organization. It was oh. how organized and thoughtful and timely our process was because they had been burned by creatives that didn't have a process and didn't have a system. And so mm. now that's a big part of our messaging cell. That's something I say on every discovery call. It's something that I bring up all the time with our clients is like, hey, this is why this is going to be great for you because here's all the tasks for the next eight weeks I devised. You know what I mean? Mm. And they have full visibility into the project. And um, it's crazy how much that you can gain insights from all of that. Speaking of social media, we are out of time, which is so bad. Um, But where can everyone find you and follow you on social media? Because I think they're going to want to read your LinkedIn and even find you on Reddit and all the places. So plug yourself and plug the podcast, please. Yes. So LinkedIn is my most active platform, Kiri Mohan. I think I'm the only one out there. I haven't checked recently, but I'm one of the few. K I R I. Um, on Instagram, you can find me at the Kiri Mohan because there was another Kiri Mohan on there. I can't believe it. Wow. But that is more my inspirational place where you'll find inspirational stories. LinkedIn is more facts and how to become a premium service provider. Um, and then of course my podcast, Her Balanced Hustle, and the link that should be in the show notes I sent to you guys is actually an interview with someone who does branding, and I thought Love that it. might resonate with your audience. So that one. Should should be specific to you guys. If you're interested in branding and scaling a branding business, that episode will be useful for you. Amazing. Well, thank you so much for your time. And thanks so much for coming on the show. Guys, if you got any value from this episode, please feel free to share it. Tag both of us. We'd love to see it. And we'll catch you next time. Bye. All right. Thank you. Thank you.